God bless you, saints. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We're on Hebrews 13, the last chapter. <clears throat> Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we're so grateful to be able to gather together this morning around your word. And Lord, we come expecting, with expecting hearts, Lord Jesus, that you'll feed us this morning. We just ask, Lord, that you'll... Give us the right attitude, Lord Jesus, and help us, Lord, to receive these things as we study these things out, Lord God. Lord, to be with Brother Wade as he's prepared and studying and laboring to bring us the word this morning. Grant us, Lord, that you'll be at liberty to move among us this morning, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen. <clears throat> now, Hebrews 13, um, when we, as we kind of get into studying this out, there's a lot of uh, commentaries online, if you, uh, people have studied these things and it's kind of, it looks a little bit odd how Paul, it, seemed, it would seem like Hebrews 12 is the close out of the book of Hebrews, and then then it looks like Hebrews 13 is just kind of, he covers a lot of things quickly and just kind of throwing a lot of things out there. Love one another and remember them that have the rule over you, and uh, we got to go beyond the camp, and all these things kind of thrown out at once. And some people say that that it looks like he, uh, you know, um, maybe a, a year or so after he wrote the book of Hebrews, he just, um, he said, I'm going to add this on at the end. Um, but either way, whatever whatever the case may be, um, it's part of the book of Hebrews, and uh, it starts out talking about what we need to love one another. So this morning I want to I wanna just kind of focus on that. Um, he said, let brotherly love, con if we can say that right, let brotherly love continue. And verse 2 be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Right. Now, there, see, he's continuing that thought. Let's be kind to one another, be kind to a stranger, because you never know when that stranger might be an angel, somebody that can help you. Be, 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 let's, let's love. And he said, remember them that are in bonds. Remember them that are going through something, as though you're bound with them. Enter into that. Now, see, there's where you're really, when you begin to enter in to the situations that people are going through and when you're praying, you're thinking about them and empathizing with them, that's what Paul is talking about. And them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. So Hebrew 13, we're, we're just going to talk about brotherly love and continue. I, I've got this little scripture, Leviticus 19:18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So that's a promise or, or, or a, a, an admonition all the way from the Old Testament to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you think about, think about brotherly love. Um, <clears throat> when we come to church, what's really happening in the life of a Christian as you're hearing the word, the word is planted in your life, and you got uh, you're you're born again, and and you know we we studied these things out that you start off with all of the things that are necessary for your journey. You got ten fingers like a little baby, ten toes like a little baby, and you begin to grow and grow and grow and push out. So you, maybe at your birth you've got you've got some uh, some little bit of, of of divine love that can be projected. But what we've got to do is grow and grow and grow precept upon precept until it's sealed in. So it's constant, it's consistent, day by day, when life throws things at you, you're responding with love and kindness in the, in the correct way. I think, honestly, this is one of the most difficult things to preach with balance, because one of the things, you start talking about brotherly love, and you go too far over to one side, and you're looking at it like, well, um, like a, a, you're looking for a kind old priest, which Brother Bram said, we don't want to. A, a kind old priest that can, you know, maybe help help pay for your bills and 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 do those sorts of things, but yet won't tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. I, I think kind, kindness, really, if you look at it scripturally and brotherly love, real biblical brotherly love, is like John the Baptist going out there and saying, "Herod, you can't, you're you got a, a marriage situation," or somebody telling the truth. But so we've got to have we have to have the right balance. You can't go over on the other side either and say, "Well, we just don't need kindness anymore." We don't need to treat one another with respect. We don't need to uh, empathize with one another. You can't go that. So you got to right, right down the middle of the road, right straight. And that's why it's so hard to, to, to articulate these things correctly. And Brother Bram said, and I will restore. He said, now the first thing that Pentecost produced 
was brotherly love. Now you think about that. What a statement. The first thing that Pentecost produced was brotherly love. It tore down the middle wall of partitions and made a brotherhood to such, such a way that they had everything in common in the Bible days, a brotherhood. Paul spoke of this brotherhood and he gave all the gifts of the Pentecostal church and then said in 1 Corinthians 13 that though I speak with tongues as men and angels and have not this love which brings the brotherhood, I am nothing. Now though I have the knowledge to understand all the mysteries of God, I am still nothing without love, the love of the brethren. <coughs> now you, you think about that. If you, if you go to tell somebody all the mysteries that you understand, and, but yet it's lacking love in your heart, and you don't really care about that brother, you just care more about sharing the information that you have, you see, it, that's what he's saying. It, it, it just, without love, everything just begins to fall apart. Right. You're, you're trying to share somebody the gospel. How can you really share the gospel effectively if they don't see kindness and love and know that, they, that you care about their, their soul? And see, that's where you really, you're getting up into brotherly love. Brotherly love is looking past all the little faults and problems that somebody has. Down in the inside of that person is, is if they're born again, is something, well, even if you're not born again, you've got a soul that's worth 10,000 worlds. And if you're born again, that's God down on the inside. So even, you know, you want to you put that in the right place too, that your, your brother has got God enthroned on their heart. And so you want to respect them. And so you're looking at that, you begin to look at things differently because of the love of God being projected. Let's, let's read what, Paul, what Brother Brown was referring to in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So it, it, if you speak with tongues and you've got a gift and, you're, uh, and the Lord's moving in your life and supernaturally, but you don't have love, then what good is that? It's like you're just going over to that symbol there and just bling on it. Bling, 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 because it's, you, there's no love. Love is, what, love, is what, love is what keeps everything together. It's, it, that's, that's, and he said, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Now you see why see why love is so so difficult to articulate correctly. Because sometimes you know maybe your mind immediately goes when you start talking about love. Well, love is corrective, and it starts going down that path. But love is many things. So that's what we want to meditate on this morning. Love is love is more than just grabbing somebody by the collar and saying you're going to do it this way. There's, there's, lo there's a lot of things that go into love. Love is being kind to one another. Love is respecting one another's boundaries. Love is respecting, thinking about what, how somebody is going to perceive the way that you present the gospel and what, trying, to, trying to win that person over. Love is all those things. Now, Brother Raymond said in pummel worm, locust, canker worm, caterpillar, he said the next thing that we'd like to say for is brotherly love has been eaten away from the vine, brotherly love. Jesus said this will all men know you're my disciples when you have love one for another. Oh, you think about what a weighty statement that is. That that's how people will know that you are Christian because of your love. Well, now let's just look at an example. If a man don't believe the same as I do, I'll go right into his congregation and preach with him. Just preach what he believes and go right ahead and let it go because I love him. Now, what, let's, let's pause it. Let's think about that. If God, if, if there's a believer that's really born again, and if they're, if they're wrong, God, if they just continue on, we've got a promise in the Bible that the spirit of truth will lead and guide us into all truth. So thereby, we can have confidence that the same God that has led us to the truth, if they're born again, and they just keep, keep pressing on, that same God, because God promised it, will lead and guide them to the truth just the way that he led us to the truth. So there, you can look past all the little differences and things and just love them and try to help them along, maybe give them some words of encouragement uh, and, and not be so quick to push the other person out and say, well, they're not, they're not part of it. By their fruits, you know them. He said, if they don't believe it and they haven't got brotherly love, they drop out, disagree, fall away. I have nothing to do with it. If they, if they haven't got brotherly love. See, we want to look past all the little, the little things that people say to us and just keep pressing on. Why don't you come to me and talk to me about it, he said. You don't know what I believe. See, what difference does it make anyhow what I believe? It's who I believe, Jesus Christ. Now, that's, that's kind of a statement to meditate on. 
He's saying it matters more who I believe than what I believe. Because if you're looking at Jesus Christ and not the minister behind the pulpit, not one another, if you're looking at Jesus Christ and you're putting one foot in front of the other, we're going to get there. Yes. So you just love one another. Amen. We're going to get there. I've never left a meeting yet with a bad taste as I know of, but you see brotherly love has been all discarded. And Paul's seen it. 1 Corinthians 13, he said, let brotherly love continue. But brotherly love has been taken away. Now let's read some scriptures about brotherly love. You know, what's re interesting is that Paul is the only one in the New Testament that used that phrase, brotherly love. There's a lot of others that Peter talked about it, that different ones talked about it in scripture that you can read about. But that phrase, brotherly love, only came from Paul. And what a strange thing. You start doing research, and, and what a strange thing to tack those two concepts together. Love and brother. Brotherly love. To put them together to represent something, something that's supernatural that God can do in your life. <clears throat> where, where uh, I mean, we'll get to it in a moment. That, that's why when we come to the house of God, we call one another brother and sister. It's more than just a symbol of respect, but it represents that we are because the life of God has been imparted to us and we're all part of the children of God, that we are spiritually, supernaturally brothers and sisters. And that, you, you really understand that, right? And, and you, 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 it, you'll begin to project the love that Paul is talking about, like in Romans chapter 12, where he said, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another. You, you'll find out when you study scripture that kindness is spoken of an awful lot. Amen. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. And in 1 Thessalonians, he said, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And 1 Peter, Peter says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. And in chapter 3, Peter said, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. And John, of course, we know John talked about love a lot. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brother you, that's how you know that's what John is saying that's how you know that you're a Christian when somebody can maybe say a little hurtful word but yeah you love them anyway when somebody does something that disappoints you but you love them anyway because you're trying to win them to the Lord and 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 beyond that so many other attributes to go into just the reasons why you love one another and John chapter 13 John said, Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you love, that you also love one another. Now, that's a pretty big thing, a pretty big statement, to love one another as Jesus loved us, because Jesus gave his life for us. He laid down everything for us, and as we're going to do later this afternoon, he got down on his knees and washed the feet of his disciple, of Peter. And, and so he, he, he abased himself and gave his life, gave everything, died, died so that they could have life. All those, so we got to live and we got to follow in that example. In verse 35, he said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have love one to another. Now, see, this is what we're growing up to in maturity. You start out with a little baby form, not really knowing quite how to express love and not being able to react the right way in different circumstances. But you grow and you grow and that, that divine love that is in you from the new birth pushes out and pushes out until you come into a mature form where you can stand there like Jesus as they were slapping him on the face and really love. You can stand there on the, on the cross like, and even like Stephen did when they were stoning him and say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. In Hebrews 13, 1, we're, we're continuing on. He said, let brotherly love continue. Now, now I, I've got this slide in here for a reason. Let's meditate on this for a moment. I, I, I actually got to listen to a little Baptist on, on YouTube doing a little Sunday school lesson, and he made this statement. 
that when he started going through Bible school, the first thing they told him, this is in a, a Bible school, that as a Christian, you will find that the people that will hurt you the most will be other Christians. Now, this, this goes into brotherly love. This is kind of the elephant in the room. <laughs> that when you're a Christian, people are going to hurt you. And the, the Christians, a lot of times, are going to say and do things more hurtful than, than people in the world, the people that you work with, because in, really because your expectations are higher. You come to church and you expect that people are going to love and be kind and everything. I, I got out the other day, just actually, I think it was yesterday or the day before, I was on the phone with a pastor, and he just began opening up to me about... Um, things that had happened in his life that things hurtful things and and my, i'm relating this because there's a lot of people that have been hurt by a lot of things and been gone through a lot of things and it's part of your christian journey that god molds you into a place where you react the right way that because as a christian that's what we're that's what we're growing up into brotherly kind as a christian you must learn to love in spite of the way that people do you and say to you, and, and you know, it, it's just part of life that th sometimes things are going to be said that you don't like. I, even, you know, I, I, was, I was meditating this morning. I, I have probably, I'm almost certain of it, said things that, that have hurt and grieved people in the past. And it hurts me to even think about that. But, you know, I, that's not my intention. I certainly, I certainly never want to want to say or do anything that would hurt somebody. And maybe, maybe now would be a good time to express my apology to you. If I've ever done anything, I'm sorry. And I'll, you come to me and I'll make it right. But, but when people, here's the Christian principle, those things are going to happen. And when they do happen, we've got to react in the right way. Because that's, and you're, it's not a rule book where we're trying to put in feathers, but it's a, something that God has to do where you eat and you eat and you eat and you push out until it's not something that you're putting on, but it's something truly genuine that God has done in your life where you can love somebody even if they hate you. Now, you think about what John Wesley said here in this quote. He said, though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike? Though we don't think alike, uh, you know, you go around this building this morning, there's probably a lot of different things, different differences of opinion. Some believe we landed on the moon. Some believe we didn't. Some believe this. Some believe that all the different kind of things that you could go through. But yet we can love one another. May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Without all doubt, we may. Herein, herein all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding these smaller differences. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, those who love their dream of a Christian community more than they love the Christian community itself become destroyers of that Christian community, even though their personal intentions may be ever so honest, earnest, and sacrificial. What's he saying? That you come to church and you have this lofty expectation of how everything's going to be, and you begin to lose sight of the fact that these are individuals, that these are people. And you stop loving one another because you've got this lofty, uh, this, you think it should be this way. You don't like the way the song service is conducted. Or maybe you don't like the personality of the minister. And you begin to lose the love for the one another. That's what he's saying. In other words, when individuals become so attached to their idealized vision of the community, they can become critical and discontented or even disruptive when the real community doesn't live up to that vision. Instead of accepting and loving the community as it is with all its imperfections, they may try to force it to fit their ideal, causing discord and potentially tearing the community apart. And we certainly don't want to force anything. Forcing is that Nicolaitan spirit where you're trying to drive people to the gospel. And that is absolutely opposed to everything that we stand for. So anyway, the point of this is to look past all the imperfections as love one another. Brother Bram said in divine love and sovereign grace, he said, now we are faced in a day that when it's prophesied to us that brotherly love would become a strange thing among people. And it's to my humble belief that that is the greatest of all the gifts that there is in God's Bible. If the Lord Jesus to stand on the platform tonight and look me in the face and say, I'm going to give you your choice, 
You can be a great person, a great minister. I'll give you a gift of preaching the gospel, or I'll give you the gift of teaching the word, or I'll give you the gift of divine healing. I'll give you the gift of prophecy, or I'll make you a prophet, or any of the fine gifts of faith. Any of the gifts that's in the Bible, I'll give them every one to you. But then I'll withhold love from you. Or either I'll give you love and withhold the gift from you. I'd say, Lord, take all the gifts and let me have the love. See, for no matter how many gifts we got, they will never do us any good except the love of God is the motive behind the gift. We must have love. Now, I was thinking, you know, how, see how important love is. It, it trumps every other gift that God could give you. And I was thinking yesterday, as, as they lowered Brother Howe down in the ground, all the words that were said about him reflecting on the love and kindness that he had displayed to people in his life. And you see, that's really, that's really maybe another elephant in the room. That's how people will remember you, is the love, the love that you had for God yes. and the love that you had for your family. The love that you showed to people at church and the kindness that you demonstrated, the way that you have reflected God. So you think about what, what really is brotherly love. And I've got a picture here of, of a brother carrying, helping another brother carry a heavy burden. When you can yoke yourself up to the other brother. Now, you see, we, we, sometimes our mind goes to, well, I don't see brotherly love. But let's go back to yesterday. You see brotherly love being on display when people are saying encouraging words to the family. People are getting up early morning to, to make them mashed potatoes, <laughs> laboring in the kitchen. All these things go together because we're helping. When somebody's in need, the whole church comes together, and you're helping somebody that's in need in a time of trouble. What is brotherly love? Love for one another. That's why we refer to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ which signifies a spiritual kinship among believers. Emphasizing that we are all part of the family of God, brotherly love in this sense means showing love and care and concern for fellow believers, supporting each other in times of need and fostering unity within the church. I'm, I'm going to skip that quote just for a minute. Love for others. Love towards all people, even those outside the faith. And love is when you, when you love the beggar on the street and try to help somebody maybe at work tell them about the gospel, that's an expression of agape love, which is selfless, selfless sacrificial love that seeks the best for others. Like doing something nice, opening up your door to somebody when there's a, maybe a visiting minister comes to the church and you, you're hospita hospitable to them and you put them up or Different ones in the church doing things, respectful dialogue, talking to one another with respect, doing things, doing things for one another, service, empathy and compassion and promotion of peace, trying to resolve conflicts in your home, trying to keep the peace between different brothers, maybe that have a differences of opinion, defending the oppressed, being generous, being generous when it comes time for a mission trip and you're willing to help out, being generous with, because why God loves a cheerful giver. Praying for one another, getting on your knees in the long hours of the night and praying because it's, it's love. You're doing it out of love and living with integrity. What is brotherly love? It's a reflection of divine love, which is why John said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. If you can love... Now, if, if, if it's really matured and grown up to you because it's bubbling out like a wellspring of everlasting water where everybody can see it, then it's evident that you know God. What is brotherly love? We, let's, we're going to dive into it. we just got a few more minutes. It's looking out for the well-being and happiness of others as if they were family. As if they were family. Now, see, our, 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 our model for the family, though, is what God says about it in his word. Because you look at a lot of families, and some families are very bitter, and they have a lot of discord and things. That's not the model I want to look at. Some families, families have different kind of dynamics and different kind of issues and things. And so we want to make sure that we're looking at the right model of what a family is. Right. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, he said, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That means when somebody's going through something, you, you want to help them out. You want to uh, you, you be there for them. 
to encourage them and give them, give them comforting words. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, he said, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. <clears throat> another thing brotherly love means, if you really examine it out, is mutual respect and regard for each other's feelings, opinions, and boundaries, treating one another with kindness and consideration. Now, I got a little kid. Now, see, this is where we can really get into the nitty-gritty of it. You think, well, I don't have boundaries and I shouldn't have boundaries, but everybody's got boundaries. When, you, when a, little, a young lady goes on a date or, or goes out with, uh, sitting down in the living room with a young man or whatever, she's got boundaries with the way that that man can talk to her and, and refer to her, and everybody's got boundaries. You'll say maybe the, maybe the simplest boundary would be like this, this little kid sitting there in the back seat of the car, and the other kid goes sitting on his side of the seat where well, you've got a boundary. And so really, when you, when you start loving one another and respecting one another, you're going to recognize that other people have boundaries and you're going to stop. When they say, you can't cross my boundary, you're going to respect that. We've got boundaries. Maybe another example of a boundary is when, when you go through the buffet line and you've got your plate of food and you've got your mashed potatoes sitting there and your boundary is, this is my food. Now, I, I, I'm willing to give it to you if you need food, but it's my food, and you can't just stick your fork in my, food, in my plate and grab my food because I've got a boundary. It, it's a boundary, and if you respect me, you'll respect my boundary. Now, now, sometimes, now th this, honestly, this gets deeper because I, I've really been studying out how Satan will try to, what, what does, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, the boundary was the promised land. And what the devil would do, the Amorites and the Moabites, well, they would cross that boundary. They'd get on the property of the Israelites. And that's the same thing that the devil will do in your life. And you got to realize, Brother Branham said that Satan is a bully. And that's what a bully does, like this picture. He'll poke, poke your fing his finger at you, try to get on your property. And you have to stand firm and say, this is my property. And you can't come on my property. Uh, you, realize, you realize you began to, you began to treat, you treat the devil like a bully and say, this is mine, God has given it to me, and recognize that God has given you boundaries that you can enforce against the devil. Uh, <clears throat> so we gotta, we, we, we've got boundaries. That's, that's just a, the, the, the reality of the thing. We've got boundaries, and when you really respect and you're really kind to one another, you will respect one another's boundaries. Respecting boundaries is, is, is part of self-respect. Setting boundaries is a sign of self-respect. It means you value yourself enough to advocate your own well-being. And I, I, I maybe uh, you, you say, well, this seems different than Luke 16, where it says that Jesus, Jesus told us that if somebody asks for your cloak, give them your tunic also. But maybe we don't have time in the few couple of minutes remaining. But there's, I, I, I just want to make the point, there's nothing wrong with standing up for your boundary and saying, this is mine. And ever, you know, you got a home, you got a fridge. When somebody comes over, if you don't want somebody poking around in your refrigerator, you can say, "I would, brother, I would rather you didn't open up my fridge. If you want something, I'll get it for you." Now, now, of course, you know, when you come to my home, if you've ever been there, you're welcome to open up the fridge or the pantry or whatever. I, I'm not going to set that boundary, but some people might, and if they do, it's common courtesy to respect that boundary because they don't want you looking in their fridge. And, and so that's what kindness is. Kindness is respecting the boundary that somebody else has. If they don't want to be talked to in a certain way, and they say, brother, I, you know, I, I don't want to be called that name. I, I, that bothers me. When you, it hurts my feelings when you call me that. Then they've set a boundary. And if you're kind and respectful and loving, then you'll respect that boundary. <laughs> now, isn't that example of this little, this little child in the back? Uh, one's poking at the other, just like how we used to do when we were riding down in the car with mama and daddy. One of them's trying to get over on the other seat. And when we were kids, we didn't respect boundaries. But when we're adults, we know better, don't we? Boundaries are for protection. Like, like the example of the, of the young lady that's got, you, you know, you're, she's talking to a young man. There's going to be boundaries of respect. A father is going to set boundaries, and you better not cross those boundaries when you're talking to a father's daughter. <laughs> boundaries protect us from being manipulated, used, or violated. Boundaries are for your emotional health. They prevent us from being overwhelmed by the needs or demands of others, allowing us to prioritize our own well-being and emotional health. Like, like some people at work, you know, they'll turn their phone off at night so because they, they got a boundary. i got to get some sleep. So they set that boundary. Don't call me after a certain time. 
And you're setting those boundaries so that you can have sane, a sane mind, a, 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 you know, good emotional health and clear communication. Boundaries help us communicate our needs and desires more clearly and assertively, reducing under, misunderstandings. Now, I've got one more minute, and I'll just close on that thought. I think most problems in relationships, most problems in a church, most problems anywhere come from miscommunication. So if you can learn to articulate things well and communicate clearly, if you, if you don't like it when, you're, when your spouse doesn't help out around the house or whatever, communicate it, and things will, that'll, that helps a whole lot. If you don't like the way that somebody's talking to you, communicate, and it will help. Communicate and set those boundaries, because if nobody knows that you're offended, nobody knows that you're hurt, then you end up having unreasonable expectations, and it just causes all sorts of problems that we're talking about. What are we talking about? Loving one another respecting, respecting, and being kind to one another. We'll stop right there. God bless you.